This is one of those passages. This passage, the message from Jesus in this passage is profound. This is one of those passages that if you take it to heart, it can radically change your life. It teaches something that we need to learn over and over and over again, my friends. About the power and impact of divine truth. Truth. The Word will set you free, my friends. So we're going to look at John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Two verses. But I want to give us some context. So I want to read 31 through 38, and then just take 31 and 32 apart into four little phrases. So read with me, if you will, John chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. 31 through 38. This is what the text says, my friends. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. That's what we're going to cover today. Boom. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave of sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son does remain forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak the things which I have seen from my father. Therefore, you also do the things which you heard from your father. The rebuke in there, right? Verses 31 through 38 contains so much stuff. We're going to spend several weeks. It'll be past Easter. We'll come back to this passage after Easter. Uh, But let's let's look at John chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Just in those two verses, there's so much stuff there. So let me give you the big picture. The sermon in a sentence. The topic sentence. the, The big idea we can hang all the details on. The sermon in the sentence is this. In John chapter 8, Verses 31 through 32, Jesus teaches that his truth, his truth, leads to freedom, my friends. His truth leads to freedom. Liberty is found in his truth. Let's take these two verses apart by breaking them down into four phrases about freedom and truth. Freedom truth. Freedom truth. The first phrase He's talking to those Jews who had believed in him. And he says this in John chapter 8, verse 31. If you abide in my word. So they have believed in Jesus. The Jews had believed in Jesus. And Jesus says, if you abide in my word. Abide. We just don't use that word very much. We don't use the word abide in everyday conversation. It's kind of a church word now. Abide. It's about the relationship. The relationship between the created and the creator. The relationship between the, those who were saved in faith in Jesus Christ in a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's all about relationship. Believing, abiding, even the Bible, it's all about our relationship with God. This is directed to those Jews who believed. So what does it mean the Jews believed in Jesus? Well, believing in Jesus is about wholehearted trust. Wholehearted faith, confidence, assurance, and reliance in the person. So they have put faith, belief, trust, assurance, confidence into Jesus. And if you put your faith, your belief, your trust in Jesus, he will save you. To believe in Jesus is to wholeheartedly, with your entire being, 
Put your trust in who Jesus is, what Jesus has taught, and what Jesus has done for us. Because he is the divine word. He lays down divine word for you and I to learn and live. And then the divine word died on the cross so that the innocent died for the guilty. So that his death and blood would wash away my sin, evil, and wickedness. That redemptive work. So it's all about relationship. Believing in Jesus is about relationship, and abiding is about relationship. And we just don't use the word abiding enough. You can cross-reference abiding. Look up John 15. John 15 is worth studying in depth, and we will, we will, Lord willing, get to John 15. It'll happen. Abiding is the idea that Jesus is the vine, and we are grafted branches into it. So we, we are attached into Jesus. So the idea is a, a plant is gardening. So to abide in Jesus is about relationship, but it's about intimacy. It's about a physical, emotional, spiritual connection with our Savior and Lord. And from that connection, we receive. We receive nourishment, we receive sustenance, we receive the food, water, and strength to carry on. Abiding. It's a, it's a big word. It's a good word. It's a word we ought to use more often. I suppose we could apply the word biding to marriage. You and your spouse abide together so that the two become one. That could, that could work. That could work. Too bad Valentine's Day is already behind us. We could come up with Valentine's Day cards about abiding. It's about relationship, and we take that relationship for granted. I'm talking about our relationship with Jesus, not our relationship with spouse. If you do that, please come see me. Relationship is all about a deep connection. And that deep connection requires communication. A healthy relationship has good quality and quantity of relationship. It's why a talker always marries a listener. Or a listener always marries a talker, right? You know who you are in that relationship, right? Yes, exactly. Um, I'm the talker in my marriage. I paused just long enough for her to say, I do, and then I kept talking until children arrived. I, I've been learning. I've been lear learning the skill of listening. It's a hard to learn. Uh, it's a lesson I have to learn over and over and over again. But just like in our marriages, just like parents to children and children to parents, we need to be communicating. It is true with our relationship with Jesus. Relationship is communication. And we have God's communication. God wants to communicate to us so clearly that he wrote it down. So that he has given us the Bible, God's inspired word, breathed from God. And so we just need to dust our Bible off. We need to just acknowledge that it is God's inspired communication. It gives us a blueprint to life. How should we live? It answers all those life questions. Think of it as, you're going back to Valentine's Day and your spouse, think of the Bible as God's love letter to you. This is, I love you, read this. When we struggle with what is God's will, when it comes to what to do, where to live, who to hang out, what to pursue as a career, the Bible tells us what God's will is. When we struggle with temptation, when we struggle with what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil, what is light, what is darkness, what is wickedness of lifestyle, wickedness of speech, Wickedness of thought. We don't have to make those rules up. God's written communication to us tells us. 
what is good, what is bad, what is evil. Let me, let me lay down six impactful truths about us in the Bible. Six impactful truths. If we'll take these to heart, it'll do wonders. Six impactful truths about our interaction with our Bible, the love letter from God. I'm going to do these quick. One, how to read the Bible. We need to be reading our Bible. That's why as a church, we have a reading plan. One chapter a day. Get through the whole Bible. Three years. The way to read the Bible is to read the Bible so that you're engaged with the text. You cannot be reading your Bible while doing something else. You can't read your Bible with the TV on. You can't read your Bible while listening to somebody yammer on. You can't read your Bible while driving in traffic. You can't. We need to be purposefully engaged with the Word, seeking understanding, seeking revelation. We need to have our ears open so that we hear what God has to say to us through His Word. If you're just reading Scripture to check it off on some list, you are doing it wrong. Second, reading it is good. We need to read it, yes. But we also need to study the Bible. And by study the Bible, I mean delve deep. There are layers and layers and layers and layers of God's love letter to us. It starts with context. Context. We should always interpret and understand a word, a sentence, a paragraph, a chapter, a book in the Bible with what is around it. So you can always just study the context of what you are reading. Study the language. It turns out the Apostle Paul did not speak English. It turns out that Jesus wasn't, you know, English speaker. So there's all kinds of language we can study. We can study the language of English so that we understand what abide means in English, yes. But we can also study what it's, the languages are in the original text. The New Testament is written mostly in Greek. It's all Greek to me. The Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And the Hebrew in the Old Testament is all consonants. There's no vowels in the Old Testament. Try to, right? That hurts, that hurts my head just thinking about it. Context, language, there's a lot of language helps. Biblehub.com lays it out for everybody. Uh, Greek and Hebrew, Aramaic's also in there. You can study theology when studying the Bible. The theology, the study of God, his character, his nature, his activities, his plan. Christology, the study of Jesus Christ. Soteriology, the study of salvation. And on and on and on. As long as we don't study schools of theology, but instead we study what the Bible says about theology. Study. Number three. We need to meditate, mediate? There's a, there's a T missing there. We need to meditate on the Bible. Don't just read it in passing, but we need to ponder God's truth. That's why we memorize scripture in this church. One verse at a time, John chapter 8, verse 12. We need to allow it to saturate the way that we think so that it becomes part of us so that it transforms our mind, our brain, the way that we think, so that it has an opportunity to change our attitude, our motivation, our purpose. We need to meditate and memorize Scripture, pondering it deeply, going back to verses we previously meditated at. Number four, memorize. See, meditate leads to memorize. As you memorize, meditate. We need to get them in our memory so that we can recall every word. Because when we're engaged in spiritual warfare, because the enemy is real, when you're engaged in temptation, when you're engaged with the enemy, the Holy Spirit will pull out Scripture memory verses to apply to that specific battle, that specific temptation. So you want to arm yourself as a warrior of God against the wickedness of the world. So we need to be memorizing Scripture. And I know memorizing a piece of Scripture can be scary and daunting. 
They're long verses. And the secret is, my friend, to learn a phrase at a time. You just learn one phrase, one phrase, one. You repeat that one phrase over and over and over again. You learn that one phrase, then you add the next phrase to it. And you just learn one phrase after another, after another, just adding the next phrase on. And before you know it, you will have the whole verse memorized, the whole paragraph memorized, the whole chapter memorized, one phrase at a time. You know, uh, small bites. Small bites help tremendously right there. Memorizing feeds that whole meditating, feeds that study, is connected to a reading. Absolutely. We need to be memorizing Scripture continuously. Yes. All right. And number five. Not only do we need to be reading and studying, but it's about application. You can memorize the entire Bible, but if you are not living it, it's worthless to you. It's about application. Putting it into practice into your life. So let the Bible verse you're memorizing impact the way you behave, the decisions you make, the way you talk, the way you think. We've got to translate the Bible principles of the Word into daily actions. Putting feet and hands to what this says to us. It's not enough just to read one of Jesus' commands. We've got to be doing it, living it. We need to be so busy living the commands we are given, we don't have the energy to live the commands we are told not to do. We're so exhausted from walking in holiness, we don't have any energy to walk in sin. Application, application, application. And us Baptists, we are not good at that. We are good at getting you saved, getting you baptized, and getting you on the rolls. And then we'll have people who have spent their entire lives, 50 years in Sunday school, and they still aren't living any of the truth. Let that not be you and me, my friends. Because it's got to have a profound impact on you and your lifestyle. That's what it's leading to. It's leading toward transformation, change. The old man is changed into the new man. You've been transferred from the domain of darkness into the domain of light. You've been radically transformed from an enemy of God to a prince or a princess in the kingdom of God. And now God sends you out to be his ambassador transformation comes through his word. Abide in my word. Big phrase. All right, moving on. Second phrase. Second phrase. True or false believers. Oh, this one's scary. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31, you are truly disciples of mine. You are truly disciples of mine if you abide in his word. Truly disciples of mine. That means there are false disciples of Jesus. There are real followers. They are false followers. There are real disciples. There are false disciples. Just like there's real apostles and false apostles. The difference is between if you're a real disciple of Jesus, you are wheat. And Jesus warns us that among the wheat, there will be weeds. Among the sheep, there will be goats. Or wolves in sheep's clothing. It's all about, are you a weed or a flower? You know, (laughs) are you a weed or a flower? Are you supposed to be in the garden or not? (laughs) It's important for us to identify counterfeit Jesuses so that we know the difference between a fake Jesus and a biblical Jesus. And we've talked about that before. And the way to do that is to distinguish between a distorted message and a true biblical message. We need to do that when it comes to a false Jesus and a biblical Jesus. We have to distinguish between the distorted and the true when it comes to false teachers and biblical teachers. 
false believers and biblical believers, false prophets and biblical prophets, false apostles, and on and on and on. We need to be able to distinguish, separate those. We need discernment, my friends. And here's the secret, because we're very bad at this. The secret is to look at the evidence. You can look at the evidence and be able to tell if they are the genuine thing or a fake copy. Evidence. Evidence in their behavior. What do they do? What do they say? What's the effect of their lives? Are they bearing fruit? Are they producing fresh water or salty water? Is what Jesus will say. We are able to then discern their motive, their attitude, and whether or not they are the authentic thing. And as bad as we are at making that kind of judgment, we fall into the trap then of the false. And sometimes we find out we've been living in the midst of the false for so long we can't even discern the true anymore. So let me give us a, an evaluation test. This is not to judge others, but to look within and judge yourself. Because as much as we need to discern between false Christ and real Christ and false and real, we need to make sure that we, you and I, are real biblical Christians. That we have attached ourselves to a biblical Jesus, and our faith is real and authentic. We need to do that. So let me give you three quiz questions. And beforehand, I admit this is a pop quiz. You haven't studied for it. I also admit how difficult this quiz is. And it cuts us to the quick. Me and you. What are the three quiz questions? First John. First John chapter 5, verse 1. The same John that wrote the uh, Gospel of John. He says this, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. Everyone who loves the Father loves the child born of Him. So you got believes and loves. And so the question is, have you believed in Jesus? Have you put your faith, your belief, your trust in him? Coming to Jesus as a sinner needing forgiving. To be a biblical Christian, you have to have faith. You have to have belief in Jesus. Be engaged in that active and intimate relationship with him. And then love for God and love for others flows from that. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1, my friends. And then 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 through 9. This is a long passage, but it talks about our greatest struggle. Our greatest struggle is seen in 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, when it comes to thinking about our faith and its authenticity. Look at what 1 John chapter 3, verses 6 through 9 says. No one who remains in him, sins continuously. No one who sins continually has seen him or knows him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. False, right? Versus right. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who has been born of God practices sin because his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin continually because he has been born of God. The faults continue to wallow in sin, evil, and wickedness. The biblical believer in Jesus Christ does not sin continuously 
but walks in increasing righteousness because of Jesus. Don't get me wrong, we still sin. It's the continually word in there. That's powerful. So, you know, what's your attitude toward sin? What's your attitude toward your continual sinning? You know, your pet sin, the sin that you're an expert at. The sin you hope no one finds out. To be a biblical Christian, you've got to reject sinning. Say no to temptation, say no to sin, say yes to righteousness. It's an ongoing struggle, my friends. People who have been doing this for decades and decades still struggle with sin and still sin. But it's the continual sin. It's the wallowing in sin. It's the living in sin. Two questions. The third question comes from Galatians chapter 5. It's pretty much the whole chapter. We've been in Galatians 5 before. And that's about walking and living in the Spirit. Are you walking in the Spirit with evidence of His fruit? The fruit of the Spirit are not actions, they're not verbs, they are evidence. So if someone looks at your life, which is a fruit tree, do they see the fruit of the Holy Spirit on it or not? To be a biblical Christian, you are living in the Holy Spirit and not doing the deeds of the flesh. Those who do the deeds of the flesh will not inherit the kingdom of God. And yet, so many times, it's the deeds of the flesh that define who we are. Pop quiz. Sorry about that. Hard questions, right? Hard questions. Carrying on. So we need to breathe after that one, right? It'll be all right. The third phrase about freedom in Jesus' truth is about truth or earthly lies. Earthy, earthy lies. Jesus says, and you shall know the truth. That's John chapter 8, verse 32. You will know the truth. You will know the truth. This is about intimate knowing. This is about taking it to heart. Not just memorization in your brain, but moving it down that 18 inches to your heart so that it becomes who you are. Intimacy, that's in the word knowing. You will know the truth. You will be intimate and passionate about God's truth. When I read that phrase, I thought about, is my life built on the foundation of the rock? Or is my life built on the sifting, shifting sands of the desert? Rock or desert? And am I really knowing the truth? Because knowing the truth is about that intimacy, is about that power, is about that living in it. It's reading, it's studying, absolutely. It's the impact of the application. Yes, yes, yes. It's a powerful, powerful thing. And if we would live by God's truth, we would make less dumb mistakes in our lives, right? Uh, where we need rescuing because we've done, made bad decisions and we find ourselves neck deep into the mud and the quicksand. Truth. Jesus' truth will set us free. And if only it was that simple, my friends, but you and I know that we're surrounded by lie. And we've been feeding on the banquet of lies our entire lives. We've got the sweet tooth for the lies. And if that wasn't bad enough, the lies that we accept, they are the soundtrack. They are the voice in our head. So the lies in our head circle around and round and round that steal our confidence in God. That convinces us that we are weak instead of victorious in Jesus Christ. The lies in our head tells us that we are unworthy, as if you could be worthy of divine forgiveness. 
It's the lies that we immediately cycle through at 3 o'clock in the morning when we wake up. Some of us for our first bathroom run, some of us for our third bathroom run. Just grateful to be waking up for that. But we buy those lies and we rehearse it. It's a worn out tape. And it defines who we are. We live with too many earthly lies in our head and not enough divine truth. And then we live like captives. There are consequences to these lies, my friends. Think of poor Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 3, the very beginning. Genesis chapter 3, they could eat from any of the trees in the orchard except one, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't do that. The devil gets in a long discussion. He's, he works hard on Eve to get Eve to do what's wrong. There's this whole, did God really say that? Oh, come on, he's just trying to keep something good away from you. The devil works hard on Eve to get her to do something wrong. And eventually Eve falls to temptation and eats from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. She bought into the devil's lie. And then she just offered it up to Adam. Here, Adam, have this. And, and, and Adam's like, all right, uh, so... Uh, you know, don't eat. Does this smell bad? You know, never do that. You know, uh, don't jump into that. And what are the consequences of that? They are kicked out of paradise. They are sent from the orchard and the garden out into the wasteland and the desert. An angel with a flaming sword has to guard and protect the way into the Garden of Eden to keep them from trying to sneak back. There are consequences to buying and living the lie we are sold. And we are victims of it, and we are good at it. We are known by our rebellious nature rather than our submissive nature. Yes, it is true. We are our worst enemy. <laughs> we are. Not only are there consequences, but there needs to be some confrontation, my friends. Acts chapter 13, verse 10. Acts chapter 13, verse 10, which I'm sure this Bible has. One page. Oh. Acts 13, verse 10, Paul confronts this magician. And he says this powerful statement, calling him the worker of the devil he is. In Acts 13, verse 10, it says this, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. How's that for a confrontation? Confronting the lie and the liar. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? You do not have to be polite to the lies you are chewing on in your head. I mean, rebuke them suckers. Call them the lies that they are. Cast them out and submit them to Jesus. You don't have to sit and let a liar feed you. Turn it off. Get up and walk out. Rebuke your BFF for filling you with all those lies. Listen, you brood of vipers. You've got to quit talking to me about this. Confront the lies we are drowning in. Because if we, children of the truth, will not stand up for truth, then we are selling out the next generation and not making it any better. All right. Oh, I apologize in advance. Self-evaluation test to ensure that you are living truth, not lies. Because we struggle with this. We struggle with it. So this is all about person. You evaluating yourself. Judging yourself. The previous pop quiz were tough questions. Now I've elevated it to three test questions. We've gone from quiz to test. Dun, 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 dun. You thought the quiz questions were hard on me. They were brutal on me. They really were. 
These test questions are even more brutal on me. If they're brutal on me, I'm sure they'll be brutal on you. This is a way for us to examine ourselves in the power of the Holy Spirit to make sure that we are living truth and not living lies. Let's jump into these three questions. As terrifying as they are. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 29. You should read that parable. Are you enduring the storms of life? Matthew chapter 7, Jesus talks about building a house on rock versus sand. If you build your house on rock, you're building your house on Jesus. If you build your house on sand, you're building your house on lies. And when the storms of life come, they completely crush the house on sand. And when the storms of life come on the house that is built on the rock, the house endures. You and I, our lives are the house. Are you building your life on rock or sand? The evidence, the test question for that is because we're all going to deal with storms of life. If it ain't storming in your life now, it will be soon, right? When you get crushed and destroyed and devastated by the storms of life, then maybe your foundation is a little more sandy than you're willing to admit. Because living biblical truth, building your life on the rock of Jesus Christ, the aftermath of the devastated storms is you survive, you endure. Instead of the rain flooding and washing you out, it it waters your garden are you surviving your storms you got to ask those questions second matthew chapter 16 verse 24 they don't they only get worse i'm sorry matthew 16 verse 24 are you denying yourself are you sacrificing yourself Are you daily following Jesus? You know Matthew 16, 24, where Jesus says, right? If you're going to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And that's supposed to be our mantra of every day of life. Every action we make, every decision we take, our entire lifestyle is supposed to be defined by denying ourselves, sacrificing ourselves and following Jesus, and yet we are more the me generation than ever before, it seems like. We are a me generation that was raised by a me generation that are raising a me generation. And a me generation is the sin that is the opposite of Matthew 16, 24. So it's a good thing to ask yourself, am I denying myself? Am I sacrificing so that it hurts? Am I following or am I trying to lead? Living truth is evidenced by how you live your life. Whether you live for yourself or you live for God. Tough test question for us. Third, ah, Matthew chapter 6, Sermon on the Mount. Verses 33 and 34. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be taken care of. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Don't worry about tomorrow. Right? Matthew chapter 6. So is your life categorized, defined, obvious to everyone around you, that you are seeking God and seeking God's righteousness above everything else. Living truth is about focusing our lives on God, not ourselves. His kingdom. Working for Him and earning heavenly treasure. Not the stuff our capitalistic democracy tells us money retirement clothes homes jesus's word to the rich man really applies to all of us 
Give everything away. Then you'll be saved. Because we fill our lives with so many idols that just steal and steal and steal and steal. All right, three. Oh, fourth. The fourth truth. Last but not least. God's freedom for you, my friends. Jesus finishes this out. John chapter 8, verse 33. And the truth shall make you free. If you live in the truth of God, you are a child of God. And you have been delivered from the slavery of sin and evil. You are liberated. Let's start living liberated in God. It is true we started off as slaves in bondage to sin, the devil, and the world. We were born that way, the human condition. And we needed rescuing by Jesus which is why Jesus went to the cross so that his death and blood could rescue you and I, master sinners. And his word, his love letter warns us of all the things that are sin, evil, and wickedness. Actions, decisions, lifestyles, words, way to talk, way to think. And that is because sin, evil, and wickedness is self-destructive. And so a sinner has to sin. Somebody in the chains of sin have to sin. Their lives are supposed to be self-destructive. But Jesus, when Jesus comes into our lives, he breaks those chains so that we are free. We are no longer wrapped in logger chains, weighed down by 50 pounds of iron holding us back. But we are free. They have fallen at our feet in Jesus Christ. And we are told to walk free. Go and sin no more, my friends. John chapter 8 starts that way, doesn't it? John chapter 8 starts that way when the Pharisees, the self-righteous rulers, bring an adulterous woman before Jesus and want him to execute her. And we studied that at length. In the end, he asks, where are your accusers, your condemners? Well, I won't condemn you. Go and sin no more. And Jesus would say that to you and I, when we have put our faith, our belief, our trust in Jesus Christ, he would say to you and to me, go and sin no more. Because we've been liberated. We are free to live for God. We are free to live godly. We are free to live in purpose. For God's kingdom. And we should be so busy doing that, we don't have the energy or time to sin. What does that mean? That means wholly devoted to serving and glorifying God. Wholly devoted to serving and glorifying God. So that that's all that we're about. Striving for continual spiritual growth and purity of heart. And then reflecting the love of God in our relationships, my friends. That's the mission we're supposed to be on. That's the life you and I are supposed to be living, free in Jesus Christ, wholly devoted, striving for purity, and reflecting love in all of our relationships. We are free indeed, my friends. Let's just start living it.